British royal family. Amongst the most famous people in the world and ambassadors for our country across the globe. Keeping them fit and well is of paramount importance. In this revelatory hour, we reveal the royal health secrets. From royal birth, in fact, when she had Prince Charles, the Queen actually had a cesarean section. To royal death. For somebody who was very glamorous, is a very sad ending to her life. From the secrets of Diana's bizarre health regimes. She loved cupping. We used to do cupping on her at least once a week. To the Queen's life-saving emergency kit. There was always a Royal Navy surgeon travelling with them, as well as the matching blood. And the outrageous fertility bed of King George IV. And while you were using it, the bed started jolting. So that the magnets and electricity had fused, giving this huge jolt of passion. No stone is left unturned as we reveal the royal health secrets. From cradle to grave. The royal family lead lives of jaw-dropping luxury and glamour in return for carrying out their duties. And there's one duty that's more important than any other. It can certainly be argued that the most important role of the royal family is to keep the royal family going. That means producing heirs and making sure that they produce heirs. The nation's rejoicing is marked by a salute of guns. Her Royal Highness is the proud and happy mother of a prince. The first stop on our tour of royal health, birth. Prince Harry dozed, behaving impeccably. We're used to royal babies born in private hospital wings and paraded in front of global press. But it was a different story when the Queen gave birth to Prince Charles in 1948. Back then, all royals opted for home or palace births. The three boys were all born at Buckingham Palace. Princess um, Anne was born at Clarence House purely because the Queen and Prince Philip had moved out of Buckingham Palace it was being renovated after damage incurred during the Second World War. In fact, when she had Prince Charles, the Queen actually had a caesarean section. She wasn't rushed to hospital. The royal doctors set up an operating theatre inside Buckingham Palace. Everything was sterilised and performed the operation so that she could have Prince Charles there and then. And if you thought her consort would have been there to support her, think again. Well, apparently Prince Philip was swimming and playing squash when Prince Charles was born, which frankly is about as useful as a man can be at these events, so he probably did entirely the right thing. Philip was around for the birth of his youngest child. By that time, it's thought that the Queen put a lot of pressure on him and said modern fathers and modern husbands are at their wives' bedside during the birth now, so you jolly well can be too. The head obstetrician was Sir John Peel, Ingrid Seawood's godfather. Only one secret about the delivery ever escaped his lips. They converted the bull room in Buckingham Palace into an operating theatre. Normally, it's a guest suite for visiting heads of state. And it was all going a bit slowly and the faces were very long. And um, Prince Philip walked in. And so, as it is Prince Philip's wont to make these kind of jokes, he said, and to think that last week, General de Gaulle was having a bath in here. And that sort of broke the ice and everybody laughed. In those days, there was no rush to display the baby. There are some very sweet pictures of the Queen in bed cuddling the baby Prince Edward, and next to the bed are her older children, Prince Charles and Princess Anne. And that group picture of the four of them shows that, I mean, Edward was at least a couple of days old by this point, but the Queen was still in bed, kind of in confinement. Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah! Things are very different today. Now, instead of presenting a baby to dignitaries, the royal couple shows him or her off to the general public just hours after birth.
And this is where it usually happens. The Lindo, a private wing of an NHS hospital close to Kensington Palace. One of the reasons that the royals have chosen the Lindo wing over other private uh, maternity units in London is because it's aligned to St Mary's Paddington Hospital. So it also has all the facilities of a fully fledged hospital. The first royal baby to be delivered here was Princess Anne's son, Peter, in 1977. Princess Anne was driven to St Mary's Hospital in London for the birth of her child. And in 1982, a media circus as Princess Diana gave birth to William, the first heir to the throne to be born in a hospital. Prince, princess and baby prince emerged to the cheers of the crowd. It must have seemed only natural for William to return 31 years later for the birth of his own son, George. Well, he's got a good pair of lungs on him, that's for sure. Uh, he's, uh, he's a big boy, he's quite heavy, but uh, we're still working on a name, so we'll have that as soon as we can. As you might expect, the place where the royals give birth does not come cheap. The Lindo Wing is very expensive. It's around £6,000 for their standard room a night. If you want the deluxe option, it's an extra £300. As this promotional video shows, the Lindo has all the facilities you'd expect of one of the country's leading maternity units. Certainly when I had my daughter there, it wasn't very glamorous at all. Um, and when Diana had William there, it wasn't, it wasn't glamorous, but now it, it, it's quite smart. And you've still got the knowledge that anything goes wrong, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be able to help you. So what's it like inside a hospital fit for the future king or queen? Catherine Philkins had her daughter Isla there in 2017, just months before Prince Louis's birth. It did feel a little bit like you were staying in a hotel in terms of the really nice toiletries that they provided for you in the bathrooms and you had you know, a room with your own ensuite bathroom and your own private room. They had selection menus that you could choose lots of delicious gourmet style food each day. They had the afternoon tea options. You could have wine and champagne if you decided I didn't do that, but if you wanted to or your partner wanted to, they could partake in that um, and really, Apart from the amenities, it was much like a normal hospital. Neither, it turns out, did Prince William at the birth of Prince George. William and Kate eventually arrived. They were sort of nervous. The whole room had been sealed off for weeks beforehand, so once it had been security cleared. And William pops his head out of the room whilst Kate is in labour and, and says, oh, could I possibly have a drink? And everyone's like, yes, of course, of course you can. It's like, oh, just a glass of water. And they were like... Of course! Cold as room temperature! And I think they were surprised, obviously, that how sort of low-key Kate and William were. And after the birth, one can relax in style, as Catherine can attest. We had booked a standard room, and when we got to our room, we were in a deluxe suite, and we were led to believe that it was the room where the royals were, and it was huge. The immaculately presented Kate has helped make the Lindo Wing photo call a modern-day institution. Any parent, I think, will probably sort of um, know what this feeling feels like. It's very special. But these photo calls are controversial. Many think they pressure other women to pretend childbirth is easy and neglect their recovery. There was a lot of talk about, did she really have to put tights on? We know that there's this etiquette that royals aren't seen without tights, but seriously, after giving birth, wriggling into a pair of tights must have been quite something. I don't think a civilised nation should be expecting women of any standing in life, whether they are uh, birthing an heir to the throne or not, to do something like that. It was just disgusting. To those people who criticised Kate's appearance, especially with Prince George, what would you want her to look like? Do you want her to look the future Queen of England as if she'd been dragged through a hedge backwards? These pictures, particularly the pictures of the birth and the presentation of Prince George, are iconic. It's the birth of a new monarch. And I think we want them to look picture perfect. She's got her looks, thankfully. No, 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 no. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> Coming up, 
the secrets of George IV's outrageous fertility bed. The bed started jolting so that the magnets and electricity had fused, giving this huge jolt of passion. And how the Queen's health is protected wherever she goes. There is always a Royal Navy surgeon travelling with them, as well as the matching blood. The modern royals seem to have no problems in the fertility department. However, back in 1779, King George IV sought some help from an upmarket fertility aid, the Celestial Bed. In 1781, James Graham, a sex doctor, a quack, a health doctor, he opened the Temple of Hymen in the Strand and he sold time on the celestial electrical throne, he sold electrical pills, electrical cream, and he also sold a knight on the celestial electrical bed for the huge sum of £50. That's over £4,300 in today's money to enhance your reproductive health. You got on the bed, and these servants were dancing around it, playing on their harps, glamour girls. And while you were using it, the bed started jolting so that the magnets and electricity had fused, giving this huge jolt of passion. Now, this was supposed to be for fertility and to create a child. And I'm afraid to say that lots of people used it just to have fun, including the future George IV, the Prince of Wales, who apparently went on there with his mistresses for a wild time. From fertility to vitality. Far from the quack doctors behind George's celestial bed, the modern royals have constant medical attention of the highest quality, and doctors at their beck and call. The medical care that the Queen receives is different from ours. She has the best doctors in the land, and she doesn't just have one doctor. There'll be three who have to consider her problems and come to a, an agreement about how best to treat it, whatever it might be. The royal doctors accompany the Queen wherever she goes. When the Queen travels, there is always a Royal Navy surgeon travelling with them, a defibrillator, as well as the matching blood. With some of the places they go to, there's never any guarantee that there is going to be the right blood, uh, and they prefer to carry their own. But the Queen's constitution isn't just down to her doctors. Her active and outdoorsy lifestyle has played a part. Isn't the Queen amazing? 93, still incredibly as fit as a fiddle, and on her feet for hours at a time. It's very impressive that the Queen should still be riding. I mean, she's not riding a fiery stallion. She rides these fell ponies who are very broad and very comfortable, a little bit armchair, because she injured her knee, and of course, she says she's a fair weather rider now, but you can't blame her for that. Many of us without the Queen's willpower need a little help to get fit. That's where personal trainer Nadia Fairweather comes in. In 2009, Princess Beatrice called in Nadia to take a 360-degree look at her diet and exercise. Beatrice came to me because uh, she had some unfortunate photos taken of her on the beach when she was a teenager, and they were quite unflattering, and they made her feel really badly about herself. I think the pressure on the princesses is really hard because they're in the public eye all of the time. You can never have an off day. A royal can face different barriers to staying fit than we do. Firstly, there's those huge banquets that Beatrice would have to attend. Our little trick was that she would eat before she left. So she had a full stomach before she arrived so that she wasn't eating everything on offer when she got there. Then there's the paparazzi and the public. Beatrice and I used to train really early in the morning to avoid people recognize her, and they would often interrupt our session. They'd get right in her face, not even ask. They'd just take a photograph of her. Someone who doesn't need help to motivate herself is the Duchess of Sussex. With Meghan, the royal family has gained a real fitness fanatic. We all know that Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex, is a yoga aficionado. Her mother is a yoga instructor, so she's been doing it all her life. And we know has even introduced Harry to the delights of yoga and has been getting him to do an early morning yoga session. 
She likes doing it in the dark with hip hop blaring, maybe a few candles. Meanwhile, Meghan's husband, Prince Harry, is a member of the swanky Kicks Gym in Chelsea. Kicks Gym, KX Chelsea, is so exclusive. It's £600 a month. Yes, it does have gym equipment in there, but it also has, you know, a restaurant, it has a spa. Prince Philip, on the other hand, has followed a more no thrills approach. When he was first married to Princess Elizabeth, he used to put on sweaters and run round the garden until he got into a, got a real sweater. The Queen thought he was mad. His tailor says that he's never actually had to take out any of his clothes. He still fits into um, all the uniforms he's had his entire life, which for a man pushing 100 is extremely impressive. The answer for everyone should be keep fit and stay alive. The secret to Philip's success is the Five Basic Exercises Programme, or 5BX, an 11-minute routine developed for the Royal Canadian Air Force. The advantages of the 5BX is that you don't need any equipment. It doesn't take up a lot of space or a lot of time, so you can do it anywhere. You have seen the five basic exercises. All the major muscles in the body have been used, so you see that it is balanced. For some royals, keeping fit and healthy isn't enough. They like to take matters into their own hands, using alternative therapies to treat themselves. The royal family for many, many generations have been fascinated by homeopathy, by alternative therapies, by the occult. Prince Charles is a passionate advocate of homeopathy and in 2019, controversially, became patron of the Faculty of Homeopathy. He's absolutely devoted to it, and it's one of the weaknesses that people see in his critical thinking. Homeopathy is based on the principle that a substance that causes a symptom can also cure that symptom. Britain's most senior doctor, Dame Sally Davis, said she was perpetually surprised homeopathy was provided on the NHS and branded it as rubbish. In 2017, NHS England stated that no GP or prescriber should be providing it at all. However, the British Homeopathic Association maintains that a growing body of published research in good quality peer-reviewed journals shows that homeopathy has a positive effect. Prince Charles should be using his absolutely huge profile and platform to be promoting something that has evidence behind it, something that is going to actually help genuinely his nation. Famously, the biggest advocate of alternative therapies in the royal family was Princess Diana. Dr. Lily Howyu is an acupuncturist who treated Diana for stress and anxiety from 1996 until her death. She come one a week, at least about six months. And after that, you know, even after one month, and she keep telling me, she said, Dr. Lily, I never feel as good as now physically. Acupuncture really can help her to calm her down, to give her more energy. And also, she said, before when she faced problem, she easily to break the tear and then lose her temper. And now she's just facing. Princess Diana always said, if it can help me, it of course can help other people with similar problems like me. But Princess Diana didn't stop at pins. In his Malabon clinic, Nish Joshi is practicing an Eastern therapy called cupping. She loved cupping. We used to do cupping on her at least once a week. What you're trying to do is you're improving the, um, the flow of, of blood into a tissue by creating a vacuum to therefore allow um, detoxification of that tissue. Diana first came to Niche in 1993, at the time of her separation from Charles. And Niche took her holistic health in hand, from cupping, osteopathy, and nutritional advice to cognitive behavioral therapy. 
visualization exercises. I'm starting to get her to sort of understand how to meditate, how to start creating a more positive attitude as well. I remember once going into her bathroom and around her mirror, she had post-it stickers with little positive messages on there. And I just thought that was really amazing that, you know, she herself used a lot of positive affirmations to motivate herself on a daily basis. Nisha's relationship with Diana was more than that between most therapists and patients. I mean, sometimes on a Sunday, she would just come over and we would just cook lunch together and just flop and, you know, watch TV. And it was fun. While many people thought Diana pursued fads, Nish thinks she was simply ahead of her time. Diane was really a sort of a trendsetter and she was exploring uh, more natural approaches to her own well-being. Alternative therapies weren't just for modern royals. From Henry VIII's gammy leg to Queen Anne after she had a fit, bloodletting was a favorite medical treatment for 2,000 years. Royalty would be bled at home but the public might come here. The old Thomas Hospital, London, now a museum. Bloodletting was used for pretty much uh, everything, from acne, uh, cholera, cancer, smallpox, tuberculosis, herpes, uh, insanity, the plague. Bloodletting was also used for kind of severe hemorrhaging, so maybe everything from a nosebleed to extreme menstruation. And in childbirth and before surgery, people would be often bled to reduce inflammation. For much of history, leeches were the method of choice to get rid of all the bad blood, royal or otherwise. This leech is uh, a, a European medicinal leech. It has three jaws in a shape of a Y, and each jaw is about 125 teeth in each jaw. And it actually saws its way in as opposed to a very sharp bite. Carl picks a leech similar to ones which have been used for centuries on the likes of Henry VIII and George III. This little leech will probably take on between one and three mils of, of blood. You can actually just feel the jaws working a little bit. Uh, and then when it drops off, the anticoagulant will carry on working for the 10 hours and so it'll just slowly drip in blood. Carl is lucky the leech is just on his leg. Rumors abound of sexually transmitted infections running rife in royal circles. There's also a case of uh, a gentleman coming into this hospital with um, gonorrhea. Uh, one of the consequences was that it caused one of his testicles, uh, they don't say which one, uh, to swell up to the size of a tennis ball. Uh, and it was the overall application of 120 leeches, not all at the same time, placed on that part of the body to reduce the swelling. Thankfully, royal doctors don't tend to reach for leeches these days. Until recently, if a king or queen needed an operation, they didn't go to hospital. The hospital came to them. In the past, most wealthy people would have been treated in their homes. They would have given birth in their homes, they would have died in their homes, and the idea of going to a hospital was absolutely anathema because that's where the poor went. And instead, in this case, the doctors would come to them. And that was the case in 1951, when the Queen's father, George VI, underwent a serious operation. It took place in the ballroom of Buckingham Palace, the same place Elizabeth II would deliver three of her children. At the Association of Anaesthetists, they have the equipment used in this high-profile and risky operation. This is an ECG machine or electrocardiogram, and it's designed to monitor the heartbeat. It's the quickest way to see if your patient's doing okay or if they're in trouble. In the 1950s, very few hospitals would have had such sophisticated equipment, so the king really did get treated like a king. The king had lung cancer at the time. He was a very heavy smoker, and the operation was to remove one of his lungs, so it was a very serious operation. The assistant anaesthetist on the day was Dr. Cyril Skur. Many years later, he explained how public interest in his health affected George. The most touching thing was that when we went to put him to sleep in the morning, he had all the Sunday papers around him, and they all had grisly details of the operation that he was likely to have. He was very apprehensive of the operation. It must have made him feel a great deal worse. I think they should have kept those papers away from him. 
Having a pneumonectomy or having one of your lungs removed is a very big operation. It was performed successfully and the king did come around and survive afterwards. But unfortunately, he did pass away within the year. The queen's father was treated at home. But that is a thing of the past. Coming up, we reveal the secrets of the Royal Hospital. It's like a posh hotel, really, with kind of operating theatres. And the family medical secrets they kept hidden. His brother, the future Edward VIII, said, who's more of an animal than anything else? He's a royal family's dirty little secret. For many centuries, the health of the monarch was seen to reflect the health of the nation. If you think about when the king or queen was the head of this country in all ways, constitutionally, if there was even a rumor or a suggestion that they were unfit to reign, it had huge ramifications for the security of the country. Even today, if you're a royal and you catch a sniffle, expect everyone to be talking about it. We expect privacy when it comes to our own bodies, but with the royal family, their bodies aren't really their own. Any kind of minor health ailment, let alone a major health ailment, particularly when it comes to the monarch, our present day queen, is not just picked over, but kind of we worry about as a nation. It's a massive story. So it's important that our royal highnesses get the best care. And instead of the palace, nowadays, royal health gets dealt with here the exclusive King Edward VII Hospital. It has 56 beds. I think it has something like four members of staff to one patient. So it's a very small hospital, but it's like a posh hotel, really, with kind of operating theatres. For Margaret Tyler, it's a place of pilgrimage. I decided one day I wanted to come down and see the hospital here. It wasn't actually really like a normal hospital. The rooms were lovely, sort of panelled and that sort of thing. It just felt like a normal large house. Charming, I would say the word is charming. One frequent patient was the Queen Mother, who despite living to the grand age of 101, was plagued at the end of her life with multiple broken bones. They might be the royal family, but they cannot stop time. They are going to get old, and with age, even though they're so cosseted and so well looked after, they are still going to be afflicted by things that happen when we're old, falls, stumbles. She had two hip operations, uh, both done at the King Edward VII, both done by the same person that did Prince Philip's hip operation and Andy Murray's hip operation. Her daughter, the Queen, has better luck with her health, but isn't immune to all illness. In 2013, the Queen had her first hospital stay in a decade, when, at the age of 86, she was struck down with gastroenteritis. Gastroenteritis is mainly vomiting and diarrhea. You can also get other symptoms like stomach cramps, fevers, muscle aches, loss of appetite. For most people, it goes away in a few days without any treatment. But in the elderly, it can be severe and it can be bad enough to get them hospitalized. When the Queen was hospitalized in 2013, it did cause a big shock because she's so famous for being in good health and not giving in to anything and certainly not cancelling any trips. She had to cancel not only some domestic trips, but a trip to Rome in Italy as well. That the Queen is so rarely ill and that she recovers so quickly, to me, is testament to her baseline health. It's so impressive that she just bounces back as well as she does. Prince Philip is another famously robust member of the royal family. But by the time he reached his 90s, even his health was beginning to fail. After the Queen's Diamond Jubilee pageant, uh, during which Prince Philip and the Queen were stood for about four hours in uh, good old English drizzle in the middle of the River Thames, he was taken to hospital with a bladder infection. And it was widely believed that this is because he had spent four hours tying a knot in it and holding it in. It's not good for anybody, but especially not when you're 90. And while getting sick isn't often a matter of choice, dangerous hobbies sure are. 
The royal family's love of horse riding is well known, but it can come at a cost, as Princess Anne found in 1976. The first many people knew about the accident was when Captain Mark Phillips galloped off to his wife's side. The princess, unconscious, was covered over with blankets as officials anxiously summoned an ambulance. Princess Anne was taken to hospital, but got lucky escaping major injury. It was later learnt that Princess Anne had cracked a vertebra. But her daughter, Zara Phillips, has not been so fortunate. She was also knocked unconscious after a fall in 2004 and broke her collarbone in 2008. Every year, unfortunately, people do die and have serious injuries as a result of horse riding, including paralysis. There are so many other sports that are much safer. The Royals might as well be bungee jumping for uh, all the safety procedures and that that they follow uh, and the risks that they run. Bungee jumping in a car park above concrete with a really rubbish elastic band. To correct her spine, Princess Eugenie underwent major back surgery. In 2018, she decided to break royal protocol with her wedding dress to send a dramatic message. When Princess Eugenie got married, uh, it was one of those moments where the royal family, the younger royals in particular, actually did a wonderful good thing for everybody else. She decided that one of the main features of her wedding dress should be quite low back and she wouldn't wear a veil. It was a major break from tradition, but meant everyone could see a long scar on her back from her childhood operation. Scoliosis is when you get a curvature and a twist to the spine. It can be severe and does need surgery and physiotherapy. In Princess Eugenie's case, she had two metal rods, one either side of her spine, put in and fixed in place with screws. She made an effort to design a dress with a big deep V at the back to show her spinal scar so that she could show every other boy and girl in the world and in the country that if you have a curve, something like a curvature of the spine, A, it can be fixed, and B, your scars are, are what make you, and there's no need to be perfect. And I thought it was, it was wonderful. I was almost in tears watching that. Eugenie proudly showed her scars off to the world. But back in 1902, the royal family were busy hiding away what they saw as a medical embarrassment. Prince John was the son of George V and Queen Mary, and by the age of four, it was obvious that he wasn't developing as fast as the children, he wasn't learning as fast, he had epileptic fits, he may have had autism, and they really started to try and hide him away. He did not go to his father's coronation, and in the First World War, he was basically put on this farm. But he never saw his siblings, and the family essentially were trying to hide him away, pretend he didn't exist. And when he died at the age of 15, his brother, the future Edward VIII, said he was more of an animal than anything else. How cruel, how unsympathetic. But to Edward, that was the way it was. He's a royal family's dirty little secret. Coming up, we see how Princess Diana took her own serious problems. She had tried to throw herself downstairs while she was pregnant. She suffered from bulimia, depression, crying fits and used them to change the way the royals dealt with mental health forever. And then she made um, a very brave decision that she was going to talk about it publicly. Anorexia or bulimia show how an individual can turn the nourishment of the body into a painful attack on themselves. The way in which the royal family tackled mental health issues has changed radically in more recent years. And much of that transformation was due to one woman. No one really knew that Princess Diana was suffering from mental health issues until the bombshell book written by Andrew Morton, which revealed that she had tried to throw herself downstairs while she was pregnant. She suffered from bulimia, depression, crying fits. She was 19 when she was thrust into the limelight, how anybody could cope with that without any sort of backup um, is beyond me. Yes, she was a member of the aristocracy. Yes, she knew which knives and forks to use at a dinner table. Yes, she knew who Bunty and Tarquin were, but 
but royal life is on a different scale. And of course, as we know now, you know, Charles was still having his affair with Camilla Parker Bowles. So it was incredibly difficult for her. Diana started seeking help for her bulimia and other issues. But like everything else she did, it was swept up into a media circus as the paparazzi ambushed her to and from her appointments to see psychotherapist Susie Orbach. And then she made um, a very brave decision that she was going to talk about it publicly. Anorexia or bulimia show how an individual can turn the nourishment of the body into a painful attack on themselves. She told me that when she gave the interview to Panorama and talked about bulimia, and she said she had so many letters saying, I'm so glad you talked about it so openly. Because, you know, we talk about all these things very, very openly now, but go back, you know, 25 years and people didn't. Unsurprisingly, Princess Diana's untimely death in 1997 had a major impact on the mental well-being of her children. I mean, Prince William and Prince Harry um, suffering mental stress and, and mental anguish really um, came as, as a result of her death. Uh, Harry was 12, William was 15. All around them, people were weeping and wailing while they were maintaining the royal family mantra, you do not show private grief on a public sleeve. They were talking to people, they were shaking hands, they were smiling, they were looking at the inscriptions on the floor of tributes. They were probably burning up inside, screaming inside. What happened on the 20th anniversary of Diana's death is that William and Harry started to talk about it. All I can hear is her laugh in my head. And that sort of crazy laugh of where there was just pure happiness shown on her face. They started to say how affected they'd been and how gut-wrenchingly awful it was and how it's taken, took them a long time to be able to deal with it. Harry talked about how he'd sought counseling. He was ready to punch someone. You know, his late 20s, he kind of tried to bottle it all up and suddenly he realised, I've got, I've got to get help. In 2016, the princes set up a mental health charity, Heads Together and revealed their secret torment. Too many people stayed quiet about their mental health challenges. And we saw that this fear of even talking about a problem often meant that issues could quickly escalate out of hand. Whenever a high profile person comes out to speak about their own mental health illnesses and problems, it does a lot for mental health because it encourages other people to do the same. In the 18th century, mental health problems weren't treated so sympathetically. George III famously suffered four bouts of madness during his reign, now thought to be mania caused by bipolar disorder. He would talk incessantly, he would hallucinate, he experienced aches and pains all over his body, and he sometimes became very violent. Desperate to cure him, George's doctors detailed his treatments in daily letters to the government. So here we've got a series of letters from the doctors who were looking after George III during the first episode of his illness in 1788 to 89. They had a lot of ideas. They would have been using traditional techniques like bloodletting, blistering, using purgatives like senna, so a laxative. To make him sick. I mean, it was pretty horrific. One of the Daily Bulletins describes how the king has been in the straight coat the whole night. So he's basically been tied in his bed. So they talk about what a terrible night he's had. This is someone who his mental health is paramount because his mental health is the country's mental health. So this is a political crisis, but yet it's all about the king's body. Another long-lived monarch who probably suffered from mental health issues, was Queen Victoria. It's highly likely that Victoria was clinically depressed after the death of Albert. She completely retreated from all of her public engagements. She dressed in black for the rest of her life. She also started to eat excessively. And again, this is one of the reasons why she soon became 
too ashamed to go into public because she had put on an enormous amount of weight. Overindulgence wasn't only Victoria's problem, as her uncle also suffered for his appetite. George IV was a man of decadent tastes and definitely didn't have an exercise regime. Historian Kate Williams has come to his pleasure palace, the Brighton Pavilion, to find the evidence. So, Martin, what have we got here? Uh, these are a selection of George IV's clothes. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Oh, gosh. So, these are... His breeches, three years before he died. Three years before, I mean, these are absolutely huge. What size are these? So, these are 54 inches around the waist. I mean, the average man now is probably... 34. Th 34, yeah. so a one and a three quarters of an average man. <laughs> exactly. Into yeah. here. His breakfast consisted of two pigeons, three beef steaks, a three quarters of a bottle of. Moselle, a glass of brandy, a glass of champagne, um, and this was just for breakfast. <laughs> no Weetabix for George. No Weetabix, no vegetables, no Weetabix, no help. And he was in such chronic pain, he had so many illnesses, even from a young age. George's appetite led to multiple health issues, including gout, hardening of the arteries, and dropsy, which all caused more problems. The gout led to cataracts, meaning he was practically blind by the end of his life. And his hands got so full of liquid, he was unable to hold even a pen. There was a point his physicians actually said, because he was so large, that actually any exercise he did would have actually been quite damaging to his health. By the end of his life, he had to sleep sitting up to avoid being suffocated by his own weight, while doctors regularly tapped his abdomen to drain excess fluid. This is the reality. A man who had had a life of excess, I mean, his health was... Shot. Absolutely shot to pieces. Yeah. Wow. It really brings home that one of the worst threats to a monarch's health is actually his or her own indulgence. But George IV wasn't the only royal who fell foul of their decadent lifestyle. The Queen's sister, Margaret, died in 2002 at the age of 71, after enduring years of bad health. Poor Princess Margaret, a lifetime of hard living, finally caught up with her, all that drinking finally caught up with her. She scalded her feet in a shower in Moustique. I mean, she didn't realize that the water was so hot. I mean, she literally was so hot, it scalded her. That was a sort of led to more and more medical problems with her. Migraines, laryngitis, bronchitis from all the smoking. 
hepatitis, pneumonia, not forgetting the three strokes. For somebody who was very glamorous, somebody who enjoyed life, to suddenly be confronted with burns that you don't quite get over, to have a number of mini strokes you don't quite get over, it was a very sad ending to her life. Thankfully, her sister the Queen is much healthier. And just as well when we've seen how the health of the monarch has been synonymous with the health of the nation for most of British history. The monarch is the physical embodiment of the state. If the monarch is ailing, the state is ailing. If the monarch is strong and healthy, the state is strong and healthy. We still wait with bated breath for every royal operation and celebrate every royal baby. And to many people, what happens to a royal body is almost as important as what happens to their own. It's always that kind of dichotomy. They're like us, but they're not like us. They live in palaces and drive around in carriages and have every kind of luxury that life could ever throw at them. But on the other hand, they are just like us because they still need hip replacements, have knee trouble, they break wrists, and so it kind of shows that they are just still like us. We have a very strange psychological connection to the royal family, as though they are our own family in some way. And so when their health suffers, we really care and we really um, are interested in it. Many people do look up to the royal family and they want them to be more beautiful than us, better dressed than us, you know, sparklier jewels than us and have better health than us.